Hi everyone, my name is Mark, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In 1995, Mansfield, Texas, located just outside Fort Worth, was a town with a population of approximately 8,000. However, during this period, the city was facing growing problems similar to those plaguing nearby Fort Worth, including gang and drug-related crimes. One teenager growing up in Mansfield in 1995 was Adrienne Jessica Jones. Adrienne Jessica Jones was a remarkable young woman who left a mark on her community. At 16, she captivated the hearts of everyone around her with her beauty and exceptional qualities. Her dedication to her studies, strong work ethic, and passion for sports made her a role model for many. In 1995, Adrienne Jessica Jones was a 16-year-old junior at Mansfield High School. From the moment she set foot on campus, she instantly became a beloved figure. Her classmates and teachers admired her for her kindness, intelligence, and infectious spirit. Adrienne Jessica Jones thrived academically. She consistently excelled in the classroom, taking advanced honors courses that challenged her to excel. Despite her busy schedule, Adrienne dedicated at least two hours of study time each night to ensure her success. Her hard work paid off as she consistently achieved high grades. After graduating from Mansfield High School, Adrienne had big plans to become a vet and help animals. In addition to excelling academically, Adrienne possessed impressive athletic abilities. She was a girls' soccer team member and demonstrated remarkable skill and dedication on the field. However, an unfortunate injury during a game forced her to withdraw from the team temporarily. Instead of losing her passion for sports, she joined the girls' cross-country team. This decision to join the cross-country team allowed Adrienne to maintain an active lifestyle and helped her get into better shape. Adrienne Jessica Jones embraced the new challenge and worked tirelessly to improve her physical fitness. Her determination and dedication paid off as she quickly emerged as a key cross-country team member. While pursuing her academic and athletic endeavors, Adrienne Jessica Jones also managed an impressive workload outside the classroom. In addition to her studies, she worked 20 hours a week at a local fast food restaurant, Golden Fried Chicken. Adrienne thrived on attention, especially from the teenage boys around Mansfield. One of her closest friends referred to her as a big flirt. She would spend at least two hours a day meticulously applying her makeup, ensuring that she looked perfect. Like most teenagers, Adrienne tested her parents' boundaries despite her good nature. She had two younger brothers, and her parents were particularly protective of her, as Mansfield was undergoing changes and there was more crime in the area. Her parents set a strict curfew for her on weekends, a little past 9 p.m., to ensure her safety. If Adrienne informed her parents of her plans, such as visiting a theme park or watching a movie, she had to present them with a ticket stub as proof. Additionally, to prevent her from sneaking out, Adrienne's father decided to nail her bedroom window shut. Although it was not a common occurrence, there were a few times when she left her house in the middle of the night to meet up with her friends. On Sunday, December 3, 1995, Adrienne received special permission from her parents to stay up late in order to have a telephone conversation with her boyfriend, Tracy Smith. Tracy was out of town with his parents for the weekend, but Adrienne was eager to talk to him. However, during the phone call, Adrienne's mother overheard her daughter tell Tracy that there was another call coming in. When Adrienne's mother asked her the caller's identity, Adrienne replied that it was David from her cross-country team. According to Adrienne, David seemed to be upset about something. The following morning, Adrienne's family woke up and got ready for work as usual. However, Adrienne's mother became concerned when she heard Adrienne's alarm going off in her bedroom. Worried about why Adrienne didn't shut off her alarm, her mom went to check on her. However, when Adrienne's mom entered the bedroom, Adrienne was nowhere to be found, and her bed was still made. It didn't look like anyone had slept in it the night before. Adrienne's mother tried to remain calm when she realized that her 16-year-old daughter had gone missing. Initially, she entertained the possibility that Adrienne had embarked on a morning run, but this notion was quickly discarded upon finding her daughter's running shoes lying on the floor in the bedroom. In the past, Adrienne had occasionally sneaked out of the house in the middle of the night to meet up with friends. However, Adrienne had never stayed out all night before, 
causing her mother concern. Her parents contacted the police, worried about their daughter, not knowing that miles away, a man had made a gruesome discovery on his farm. At approximately 7 a.m. on Seton Road in Grand Prairie, Texas, about 10 miles from Mansfield, a man stumbled upon a distressing discovery. While walking to his mailbox, he noticed that the gate to his property had been knocked down. Intrigued, the man ventured onto the farm, where an unexpected sight awaited him. Initially, the man mistook the lump on the ground for roadkill. However, as he approached closer, he realized that he was looking at something far more sinister. The lifeless body of a deceased teenage girl lay before him. After discovering the deceased body on the farmland, the man promptly called the police. When the police arrived at the scene, they noticed a chilling sight. The teenager had been shot twice, with gunshot wounds evident on her left cheek and her forehead. Clearly, this was an execution-style killing. Furthermore, the police officers observed that the teenager had sustained severe injuries to the head. In addition to gunshot wounds and head injuries, the police officers noticed that the teenager was covered in scrapes and bruises all over her arms and legs. These injuries were the result of her running through the barbed wire gate at the front of the farm. She had put up a desperate fight for her life. Even more disturbingly, the teenager was dressed in night clothes. It was as if she had intended to bed, but her life took a tragic turn. The officers wondered if there was any connection to gang violence or drugs, considering the execution-style nature of the killing. After the discovery on the farm of the murdered teenager's body, the Grand Prairie Police took immediate action and sent out a teletype to all area agencies. This teletype contained the basic description of the young girl's body, including her approximate age range, height and weight, and other physical descriptions. The intent was to share this information and raise awareness, hoping another agency might have a missing person matching the victim in Grand Prairie. It was only a matter of time before the Mansfield police contacted the Grand Prairie officers. Through their investigation, the Mansfield police were able to identify the murdered teenager as Adrienne Jones. Once the police identified the deceased teenager in Grand Prairie as Adrienne, the next step was to notify her worried parents about the tragic turn of events. When the police told Adrienne's mother her daughter had been killed, she fell apart. Because Mansfield was a small town, it wasn't long before the news of Adrienne's murder reached her classmates and friends at Mansfield High School. As news of Adrienne's death spread throughout the halls, classes were stopped, and Adrienne's peers cried with one another. The people of Mansfield were on edge after the discovery of the murdered body of Adrienne Jones in a field. Theories were swirling about what might have led to her tragic death. One prevalent idea was that she was somehow involved in drugs. Others wondered if there was possibly a serial killer lurking in their midst. Adrienne's parents reported to the police the last time they had seen their daughter. Her mother provided details regarding a phone call Adrienne had with her boyfriend Tracy, as well as another teenager, David, who called in while she was on the phone. According to the mother, one of Adrienne's younger brothers heard the sound of a car engine outside the house sometime after midnight. Upon looking outside, the brother observed a pickup truck leaving the scene. The police were determined to find out who this David was who called Adrienne on the night she was murdered. In an effort to gather more information, they turned to Adrienne's cross-country coach. Adrienne's coach mentioned that there was a team member named David Graham. However, the coach expressed surprise upon learning that David would have been calling Adrienne, as she had never had any reason to believe that Adrienne and David had interacted. David Graham was an all-American teenager. At seven, after seeing his first air show, David told his father he wanted to become an Air Force pilot. From that moment on, he dedicated himself to achieving his dream. At Mansfield High School, David was popular and well-liked by his peers. He had a natural charisma, and was always up for a good time. Many girls had caught his eye, but he was taken by a high school senior named Diane Zamora. Diane stood out from the crowd. She shared David's desire to enter the military one day and actively pursued her aspirations. In the days after Adrienne's murder, the police conducted interviews with David Graham. David admitted that he had known Adrienne from their time together on the cross-country team but he insisted that their relationship had never progressed beyond acquaintances. 
During the interview, the police questioned David about whether he contacted Adrienne on the night she was killed. He adamantly denied the allegation, stating that he had been at home studying with his girlfriend, Diane Zamora. The police conducted a thorough investigation of David, considering him as a suspect in the murder of Adrienne. As part of this investigation, they sought information from Adrienne's friends to determine if she had ever spoken about David. One of her closest friends informed the police that she knew about Adrienne's innermost secrets, but had never discussed David with her. Additionally, when the police accessed Adrienne's phone book, they noticed that David's number was not written down. This discovery further strengthened their belief that David had had nothing to do with Adrienne's murder and never even offered him a polygraph test. Consequently, the police removed David from their list of suspects. After David, the next suspect police looked into in connection to the murder of Adrienne was her boyfriend, Tracy Smith. However, the police were able to confirm Tracy's alibi as he was out of town with his family on the night of the murder. Additionally, Tracy submitted to and passed a polygraph examination, which further supported his innocence. When Tracy Smith's interview with the police, he provided them with the name of a person who he believed should be investigated in relation to the murder of Adrienne. Tracy stated that on the night of Adrienne's murder, she had informed him of someone named Brian, who had called while they were on the phone. The police initiated an investigation into the identity of Brian. Their investigation revealed that the person in question was a local teenager named Brian McMillian. During the investigation of Brian McMillian, the police made a discovery. They learned that Brian used to work in a pharmacy near a restaurant where Adrienne used to work, and Brian had developed a fascination with Adrienne. Brian would frequently visit the restaurant to catch a glimpse of her. However, Adrienne grew tired of his constant presence and resorted to hiding in the back whenever she saw him coming. The police interviewed Brian McMillian concerning the murder of Adrienne Jones and initially denied any knowledge of her. However, Brian later admitted to knowing her. During the interview, one officer asked Brian if he had spoken with Adrienne on the night of her murder, to which he claimed not to remember. According to Brian, on the night of the murder, he had been drinking because he was depressed and lonely. One officer asked Brian if he had visited Adrienne's house the night she was killed, to which he admitted he might have. At the end of the interview, the police officers asked Brian's father if Brian could take a polygraph test, but Brian's father said no. One week after Brian's interview with the police, the officers stormed his house armed with guns. It was a decision that was made with careful consideration, as there was uncertainty surrounding whether Brian could be armed at the time of his arrest. The police had reason to believe that Brian might have a weapon, and they wanted to take all necessary precautions to ensure their safety, as well as that of everyone involved. After Brian was arrested for the murder of Adrienne, many individuals came forward to express their support on his behalf. His friends described him as gentle and non-violent. Additionally, Brian's father confirmed that he was at home the entire night that Adrienne was killed and never left the house. Brian spent three weeks in jail, including missing Christmas and New Year's, awaiting further investigation and legal proceedings. During this time, the district attorney's office arranged for Brian to take a polygraph test, which he passed with flying colors. With this outcome, the district attorney's office was left with little other evidence to connect Brian to Adrienne's murder and released him from custody. Nine months into the investigation into Adrienne's murder, the police in Mansfield, Texas, finally got the break they needed, and it came from Annapolis, Maryland, where Diane Zamora was attending the Naval Academy. According to the officers from the Naval Academy, Diane Zamora had confessed to some of her fellow cadets that back home in Mansfield, Texas, she and her boyfriend, David Graham, had murdered a girl named Adrienne Jones. The police officers from Mansfield went to Annapolis, Maryland, to interview Diane right away. During the interview, Diane denied making any such admission. However, the Naval Academy decided to suspend her and send her home as the matter was looked into. Because the police couldn't get any information out of Diane, they traveled to Colorado Springs, Colorado to question David Graham at the Air Force Academy. When the police interviewed David, he said he didn't know why Diane would make up a story about killing Adrienne Jones. However, as the interview progressed, 
David started to crack and asked to write a statement. In four and a half page confession letter, David laid out all the details about how he and his girlfriend Diane planned to murder Adrienne Jones. In the letter written by David, he described a cross-country event where he decided to offer to drive Adrienne home in November 1995. During the ride, they parked in an elementary school parking lot and had intercourse. David admits that he felt a deep sense of guilt after this encounter. The reason for his guilt was simple. He loved his girlfriend, Diane, so much and knew that his actions would cause her immense pain. One evening, as David was helping Diane study for her SATs, an argument erupted between them. Unable to contain the guilt any longer, David decided to confess his infidelity. Breaking down in tears, he sat on the couch and told Diane that he had not remained faithful to her. He then went on to describe how he had hooked up with Adrienne. After David confessed to Diane that he had been unfaithful to her with Adrienne, Diane was inconsolable. The betrayal shattered her heart, leaving her feeling deeply hurt and enraged. Diane's anger boiled over, and she lashed out, arguing with David and screaming at him. She wished he were dead, and she felt intense hatred towards Adrienne. Diane's emotions were overwhelming, and she struggled to make sense of what had happened. David admitted he told Diane he would do whatever she wanted to save their relationship. He said that he and Diane came to the conclusion there was only one way to make their love right again. Murder, Adrainy Jones. David wrote in his confession letter that on December 3rd, he called Adrienne Jones and asked her to sneak out of her house late at night to talk. He requested Adrienne to keep the meeting confidential and between the two of them. Initially, David stated that he intended to get Adrienne alone, break her neck, and then dispose of her body by dumping it into a lake. At 2.30 a.m., David picked up Adrienne in his car. Diane, who was hiding in the hatchback, accompanied them. Once David reached a secluded spot 10 miles out of town, he turned off the highway onto Seton Road. David stopped on the side of the road, and Adrienne made a subtle adjustment to her seat, creating the impression that she and David were about to engage in an intimate moment. However, David had secretly summoned Diane from the trunk. Diane emerged from the rear of the vehicle and made her way around to the front of the car. As she approached, she confronted Adrienne, seated in the passenger seat. After Diane confronted Adrienne, Diane hit her in the head with a weight from David's gym set. Despite being grievously wounded, Adrienne did not die. Somehow, Adrienne managed to crawl out David's car window and escape. David and Diane panicked, so David grabbed his Makarov 9mm weapon and ran after Adrienne. Adrienne was very hurt, and because of her head wound, didn't make it far and collapsed in a field nearby. When David caught up to her, he shot Adrienne two times before walking back to his car. Once Adrienne was deceased, the first words Diane and David said to one another were, I love you. After David confessed to murdering Adrienne, the police returned to question Diane, who had a confession statement of her own. David and Diane were arrested and charged with capital murder. However, both would later recant their confessions, with David claiming that Diane had committed the crime by herself and Diane alleging that David had acted alone. In 1998, Adrienne's mother filed a petition with the court requesting that the death penalty be removed as an option for David and Diane. Diane's trial began in February of that year. Several witnesses testified in court that Diane did not show any remorse for murdering Adrienne Jones. After deliberation, the jury found Diane guilty of capital murder on February 17th. As a result of the guilty verdict, Diane received an automatic sentence of life imprisonment with parole eligibility in 40 years. David Graham was also found guilty of the murder of Adrian Jones. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 40 years.